8,000 workers at Amazon's Staten Island warehouse have successfully voted to form the retail giant's first unionized workplace ever in an upset victory that rocked the world of organized labor this weekend. The David versus Goliath come from behind win was made possible by an aggressive guerrilla style organizing campaign from the Amazon labor union. An independent grassroots group led by former Amazon employee Chris Smalls, who was fired in 2020 for organizing protests over unsafe working conditions. The ALU formed only last year and beat out Amazon's multi-million dollar union busting operation with only $120,000 raised through GoFundMe. Here's Chris Smalls' first speech after the vote was counted. Well, I can tell you now, uh, we, we got the juggler. We went for the juggler. And we went for the top dog because we want every other industry, every other uh, business to know that uh, things have changed. We're going we gonna to unionize. We're not going to quit our jobs anymore. And, uh, you know, this is a prime example uh, of what, what the power that people have when they come together. Chris, what's your message to Amazon executives today after this victory? Oh, they're going to have to negotiate with their workers now. Status quo news is Jordan Cheriton has been on the ground outside the JFK 8 warehouse with ALU organizers for over a year now. He said Friday's results constitutes one of the biggest victories for the working class this century. Journalist and CEO of Status quo news, Jordan Cheriton, joins us now. Welcome back to Rising. Hey, thanks for having me. So you've been there. So, you know, what are you seeing? What's uh, what, what's the mood? Everybody's really excited about this outcome. And, and, and talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing. Yeah, I think um, it's a mix of kind of uh, celebration, pop and champagne, uh, <laughs> disbelief among uh, a lot of the organizers uh, mixed with. All right. Back to work because they actually have uh, both another vote coming up at the warehouse across the street in Staten Island. And uh, obviously they want to, they already sent a letter uh, to Amazon uh, setting, demanding a date uh, to schedule the beginning of collective bargaining because uh, they know Amazon is going to drag their feet. So I would say it's both uh, celebratory, but also, you know, there's more work to do. And jo J uh, Jordan, I'd love to get your take on this because if you, you've talked to a lot of workers involved in different organizing campaigns, and, and my experience has been that one of the arguments that works the best that that management gives to those workers is the union is just they're a bunch of outsiders they're going to come from out of town they're going to put a bunch of dues on on you then they're going to take your money and they're going to you know live lavish lifestyles on the back of your work now i don't i don't think that's a fair uh, criticism but that's kind of the management line on what unions are by being an independent union a alu really kind of eliminated that the ability of management to have that argument because it's like okay you're going to be paying dues but it's just going to be going into this you know independent union that is just that is just you there's no there's no other person that you can say it is so how 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 significant do you think that was that the workers could say if the dues are going to us not to some gigantic union elsewhere but or what else made it so that Smalls and, and his team of organizers were able to win this, whereas you know much better funded unions have failed in the past. Yeah, I think that uh, specifically Christian Smalls and Derek Palmer, who uh, were the heads of the a Amazon labor union, Christian Smalls actually was part of the group that opened this warehouse four years ago, and he trained and supervised a lot of the workers. Uh, Derek Palmer has been with Amazon for five, six years. So I think having uh, workers that know the building, know a lot of the other workers. Uh, it established an instant credibility uh, for at least other workers to listen to them. Uh, whereas, you know, in the Bessemer, Alabama effort, it was an outside union coming in. Uh, so it goes to that kind of outsider. They're not as connected to conditions on the ground. They don't have relationships with the workers. Uh, the other thing, and it's, it's, it's a bunch of little things, but they make an impact. You know, they, they started using donations to deliver free food uh, every day uh, to workers at the warehouse. These are paycheck to paycheck workers. A lot of them travel two to three hours uh, from other bu bu bureaus in uh, boroughs in New York City, ferry, bus, subway, just to get there. Uh, so getting, you know, a free meal every day. Uh, and I witnessed that line for free food. That's where uh, Amazon labor union organizers connected with the workers, passed out literature on the unions with, um, 
you know, the food, things like that. So it kind of established the camaraderie and you mix that with Amazon's, uh, you know, just union busting like I've never seen. Uh, you had on one side people doing for you if you're a worker and helping you. And on the other side, Amazon flooding the zone with anti-union propaganda. So, Jordan, um, you know, New York is a Democratic state, prides itself, as many Democratic states do, blue states, as being for the people, um, having more regulation that is supposed to be better for giving workers better working conditions. So this is in New York. Clearly, you know, the, the, I would imagine New York State does have actually quite a few controls and maybe even higher minimum wage and and more regulations. What do these Amazon workers expect to get out of the union that they're not getting out of the government legislation already in place in New York? Yeah, I mean, the government legislation only goes so far because, frankly, the National Labor Relations Board uh, doesn't have much teeth, uh, as we saw in Alabama. I mean, Amazon was uh, ruled that they broke the law in the original uh, union campaign, but nothing, you know, there was no real penalty for them other than a redo. Uh, so union, uh, it's more of a cultural thing in New York, as far as it's a, more of a union town, has some of the highest union percentage in, in America among states. Uh, but I, I don't really know if uh, any regulations in New York protected them more. They did file uh, 16 uh, compl uh, formal complaints with the National Labor Relations Board New York office uh, and the NLRB ruled in their favor for several things. Uh, but, you know, I think, yes, being in New York helped them, but I really think it was their campaign, uh, them connecting with workers, uh, the food distribution. They actually made uh, specific types of food for certain workers like West African rice, uh, mm -hmm. meals for a lot of the Latino workforce. I think that really made a big difference. Um, so yes, New York being a union town, it definitely helped, but I don't think any regulations per se uh, helped them win. What were the, uh, you said Amazon engaged in like just crazy over the top uh, propaganda. Uh, you know, what, what specifically were the practices that Amazon was doing to discourage this union drive that, that you found so objectionable? Yeah, so uh, I reported for Status Quo months ago. I mean, you, you literally couldn't go to the bathroom in this warehouse without union busting signs. It was literally in the bathroom, like as you're in the uh, toilet. Uh, they had it all over uh, the bathroom. They were confiscating union pamphlets in the break room, which is uh, against um, uh, NLRB uh, legislation. Uh, they were also putting cameras outside by the union tent, so surveilling uh, w workers and what they were doing. Uh, they also, um, you know, during this campaign, were flooding the warehouse with union busting uh, consultants, as they called it, uh, who were pulling workers aside off their shift, uh, in some cases for a half hour, 40 minutes, giving them kind of lectures against the union, which actually penalized the workers because they're clocked uh, by the second uh, for productivity. Uh, they also, towards the end, were calling workers at their house uh, to sway them against the union, mail sending mailers uh, to workers' homes against the union. Uh, and also these union busting consultants were basically telling the workers, you know, if this goes through, we're going to have to cut hours. We might have to cut staff. Benefits won't be as great. And the final the final thing, which I really believe, based on talking to workers, backfired big time. They were having mandatory union busting sessions every day, including the overnight shift. People sitting through half hour sessions at 430 in the morning. And I spoke with workers who were literally forced to be in those sessions 10, 11, 12 times hearing the same propaganda. And, you know, it's kind of human psychology. You keep telling people not to do something. It makes them think, well, maybe I maybe I want to do it. Uh, so I think all of that collectively really, really started workers that were on the fence made them more uh, open to listening to what the union had to say. Uh, you, you also reported on uh, the uh, criticism by Christian Smalls of some New York politicians, particularly uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for not showing up to an, uh, an event. Can you talk a little bit about what the status of, of that is now and what was, what was behind that? Yeah, over the summer, uh, I covered the ALU's first press conference, and they had promoted uh, AOC coming, which obviously could draw more media attention, uh, buzz. Uh, and then when I got there, you know, they 
she had canceled on them the night before, citing security concerns. Uh, you know, Christian was diplomatic about it at the time. Uh, I think that coupled with after not showing up uh, to the rally that she had confirmed for, um, they couldn't even get her to tweet out uh, support uh, linked to their website uh, in the in the final months. So uh, that uh, include not just her, uh, Jamal Bowman, who rep represents uh, New York, Mondaire Jones, who's a New York congressman. Uh, so I think that collectively, uh, particularly not so much, yeah, they wanted help with donations, but a lot of those workers that they were trying to convince are younger and aren't really into politics, but they know AOC. So AOC either showing up or at least doing some digital stuff, uh, they felt could have helped them in uh, connecting with workers, particularly the younger workers who don't know much about unions and, you know, feel they don't have a lot of other job opportunities. So we're more open to Amazon's, uh, you know, union busting. So, uh, yeah, AOC cited security concerns, this and that. So, uh, you know, I kind of asked her, well, <laughs> what's the security concern about tweeting? Uh, I, I didn't get a response on that one. Mm -hmm. And the fight is really just starting because now they, you know, they've got to get a contract next. And like you said, there's another another vote coming up. Do you know, one, do you know the status of the relationship? Or, or, you know, are the Democratic, because there are also a lot of state senators and uh, state assembly members, you know, who could be able to, you know, push this forward as well. Do you know if there's a coalition building there? And what's your sense of how the, the second warehouse is going to go? Well, uh, More Perfect Union has a tracker and uh unless something's changed, as, as of our discussion, uh, no one in the Democratic leadership <laughs> uh, has commented on this. And of mm. course, no, no Republicans have. Uh, you've had Bernie, Ed Markey, you know, a couple people that you would expect uh, to congratulate them. Uh, in New York, uh, you know, I was talking with uh, Christian the other day, uh, a lot of city council folk and people who were also kind of silent are now reaching out to the union. So kind of normal Johnny come lately politics. Uh, you know, now they're kind of doing the right thing. Uh, so I think particularly local New York politics, there's there's more uh, support now, uh, public support among politicians who weren't saying anything before. And uh, the second uh, the second vote, you know, can't really predict for certain. Uh, I really think it depends what Amazon does between now and the vote, which will happen uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, if Amazon goes scorched earth, uh, starts maybe, you know, retaliating against uh, workers, which we've seen Starbucks do firing some of the union organizers, uh, that might, you know, worry uh, peop uh, workers who are eligible to vote in the next warehouse. But as of now, if nothing dramatic changes, I expect that to be victorious too, because it's right across the street and it's the same union tent, you know, just talking to workers in the other direction. Mm. Mm. Well, the, the Biden White House has actually voiced its support for the newly formed union. Let's watch that. Well, the president was glad to see workers ensure their voices are heard uh, with respect to important workplace decisions. He believes firmly that every worker in every state must have a free and fair choice to join a union and the right to bargain collectively with their employer. Uh, the Amazon workers in Staten Island made their choice to organize a grassroots union and bargain for better jobs and a better life. Yeah. So Biden, you know, speaking up or through Saki, uh, you know, what do you make of that? Uh, I mean, talk is cheap. I'll give Biden uh, the benefit on he, he has appointed uh, within labor positions uh, a lot, you know, a lot stronger uh, pro-labor um, uh, kind of bureaucrats. Uh, so credit to him for that. But, you know, they you know, he has not lifted a finger as far as the PRO Act, uh, which could have been folded in to build back better or separate legislation, at least fight for it. Uh, he, so, you, you know, they could give that kind of uh, uh, low decibel congratulations, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. they haven't done anything mm -hmm. on the PRO Act and they certainly haven't done anything as far as, I mean, it's in the news all the time uh, as far as Amazon's working conditions. I reported over the summer workers were fainting and being uh, carted off on stretchers. Uh, the New York Times had a big piece a couple months ago. So, you know, they, they see they seemed a lot more loud as far as the Chicago uh, teachers union and covid than congratulating Amazon workers. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Jordan Sheraton. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tomorrow on Rising, we'll continue to follow the latest out of Ukraine. And of course, we'll tell you what's on our radars. Plus, Rachel Bovard will weigh in on the implications of Elon Musk buying that nine percent stake in Twitter. 
Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so that you never miss any of our content. And for those of you who like to listen on the go, you can see here we've got a podcast. So make sure that you subscribe and share our podcast as well. And one last thing before we go, before we say goodbye, our executive producer, Casey Brady, had a birthday yesterday. You know, guys, I'm making a birthday. So happy birthday to our wonderful yes. executive producer who does so much amazing work for the show. Uh, just so happy birthday. Another trip around the sun. Happy birthday, Casey. Mm -hmm. We have a really great team. The people who work here are we fantastic. Really do. The best people. The best, the best, the best people. Best. It's true. It's true, though. It's true. <laughs> Actually true. All right. All right, yeah, see y'all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>